Hello, welcome to episode nine of the Wilder Podcast. Chloe, hello. Good evening, everyone. This is a slightly special, maybe that's over-egging. I think it's special. I think it's really a marker of our journey, this episode. Yeah, we, we, we've chosen not to, so forgive us not to interview one of our amazing guests for this episode because we think a lot has happened. Firstly, we start with apologies, which I think is always good an episode to say, that, sorry, this episode is a few days late coming out, but we've had a lot on. And as we go through this, you will probably appreciate why. But Chloe and I were chatting and we just thought, although we have some amazing interviews lined up and in the bag ready to come out, we felt that there's a lot happened and it would really help us and you, the listener, I hope, to join us on our journey by us recapping it. In that journey of recapping, we're also doing some reflecting on what we've appreciated so far, what we've learned, some of the challenges, and a big announcement at the end of the episode for those of you that make it that far. Dun, dun, dun. I think there'll be, there'll be lots of people listening that'll enjoy that. I hope so. And, and I guess, as you say, it has been quite a useful process for us. So yeah, forgive us for using the podcast as a way of organising our own brains. It's therapy, yes, basically. it is. I love quite the fact, cathartic. Yeah, no, the psychologist in the room. Let's reflect <laughs> on this, shall we? Shall we start with the recap? I think before we do that, we need to mention our new tech setup because it's I can see it's making you feel uncomfortable. I'm hugely uncomfortable. This is not the way I should be doing my podcast. So rather than us both kind of like hunching over this one microphone about three inches away from each other, we now have these funky, what they call like wireless stop mics. Talk, it's like working with my mother with technology, Chloe. Stop looking, talk. You'd have to talk into it. <laughs> it's, Sorry. it's a clip on microphone, which is all wireless. It's really cool. Apart from I feel really naked right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and we're also looking at our new funky whiteboard. Yeah, I know, 21st century. Yeah, we've gone back to uh, to writing with whiteboard pens on a whiteboard to help. Yeah. We've got a blue sky thinking board and then you can swizzle it around and we have the, the to-do list streams <laughs> on the other side. It feels I feel like we've gone a bit crazy living in the middle of nowhere by ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great idea, let's tell everybody about it. Okay, so recap-wise, Grange Project, all about... Uh, wilding our 80 acres following the journey speaking to amazing people talking about climate change biodiversity loss we've since starting just nine episodes ago we've got a podcast got a website the podcast has got you know getting into the tens of thousands of downloads on well, thank you everybody that's listening <laughs> we've I've got the website up and running got social media instagram again into thousands facebook we've had visitors to the site to walk around and experience it including amazing kind of the listeners of the podcast but also the director of Rewilding Britain, conservation charities, a well-known vegan chef, and our neighbours have come around and had a good poke around, a good chat, um, and and experienced it. So it's been a really, you know, just in that, it's been wonderful. Yeah, it's just amazing how walking and talking the land with different people who've got different perspectives, different ideas, sometimes it's been a bit mind-blown because everyone that's come has perhaps had a slightly different perspective or an idea or a reflection and we'll perhaps touch on that a bit later about some of the challenges but overall I feel like all the connections we've made have added complete richness to our journey so far. Definitely and yes no, I want to jump into discussing that but let's, let's stick to the recap and yes. then we can move on. To we have a plan that's not deviated. <laughs> we have a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah exactly with the plan on it. <laughs> this is not how I operate Chloe. <laughs> Um, those that know Chloe will know that she's loving this. Obviously, we've done our pre-application, which we, we talk, spoke about on the last episode, and we have an update. We had the, Today, we had the visit from the local planner, as so we can update on that. When We haven't written on the whiteboard, Chloe, when are we going to do that? We're doing that in the section on what we're looking forward to. Okay, excellent. That might give a little hint this... as to how the visit went. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we also need to talk about some of the physical changes that have happened on the land. Yes, and that's been pretty much in the last week, hasn't yeah. it, predominantly. Well, and that's actually been, that's been so nice, hasn't it, to really see, as well as all the kind of stuff that's been happening on the on the internet and through people visiting conversations, we've actually in the last, as you say, the last couple of weeks, done something. Yes. Where do I even start with that? We'll, we'll come on to rewilding and wilding advice, I think, just a little bit later on when we finish off this recap. But in terms of what we've been doing on the land over the last week, we uh, have had our solar panel array installed. That's 38 kilowatts worth of solar panels and an ungodly amount of batteries to help us stay as off grid as we possibly can be, which is super exciting. And today was a day where we turned on half of them and watched them, you know, charging up our batteries and, you know, just that feeling of having the lights turned on and knowing that that's just that's just power from the sun that's come in. And I'm really excited to see how that can help power our car, obviously the heating in our house eventually when we get the air source heat pumps, and also if and when we build this education centre, again, that's all going to be ran by renewable energy, which is exciting. We also, because we need to 
dig a massive trench from our bottom bars to our house to convey the power from the barns and the solar panels down to the house. We had diggers on site and I've never used a digger before. And I've also found it bizarre and weird that when people get really excited about, oh, you've got a digger, that's, can I come? I'd love nothing more than to sit on a digger all day and, and do digger type things. So it's, I, mean, I think our son William would, would disagree with you on that front. Yeah, well, I've never been one of those people, but it's probably because I've never used a digger before. And this week has been up in the top I, five of my life. I think Tom and William have been equally happy <laughs> to there this week. Uh, there's been lots of, uh, come and see my new digger daddy and off they go. And I don't know, what, what would you describe as what you've been doing, Tom? Um, I've been connecting with my spirit animal. And what is your spirit animal? Wild boar. <laughs> and then this is, I guess, one of the fortunate things for us about having lived in the forest of Dean is that we are pretty familiar with the activities of the wild boar and well, what historically would have described as the mess that they create, but how would we refrain that now? I mean, it's still a mess. <laughs> Ecological disturbance, Tom, that's the Sorry, yes. you're looking for. Yeah. Well, yes, we are defielding. We are, we're doing our best to make our fields look less like a field and more like something you'd might find in nature. And it's been this bit that, that a wild boar has had a time of their life on. And I and I guess in a, in a nutshell, what that does is help to expose some of the bare soil in places which enables seeds of different types than just grass to hopefully germinate and bring more diversity into the fields. Yeah, and, and taking it a step further back from that, we were reading the Book of Wilding and looking at scarification and what you know some of the steps you could do in terms of yeah you know, what you should be doing on the way to wilding your land. And we thought, well, we probably should start doing that. And obviously, that was based on advice from people that we've met as well. Oh, and I, again, it's okay to fail. So first thing I went, did, I went to our local farmer, Phil, super nice guy. Phil, can I borrow something that kind of will get under the surface just enough to pull up the grass? He said, yeah, Tom, use my harrow. I was like, great. I mean, not so sure. I mean, let's try it. So let me borrow his tra- one of his tractors. Now, it, it wasn't his poshest one, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fair enough because I've never used one before. And we put it on the fields and tried to scarify using a harrow. Now, Spoiler alert, doesn't work. And so within 15 minutes, I went back with my tail between my legs to Phil and legs and Phil, say, Phil, I'm really sorry. Thanks so much for setting this up, but it just doesn't achieve what you wanted to achieve. And then we had an amazing conversation with Sarah King from Rewilding Britain. And we'll come back to that in more detail a little bit later on. But one thing she mentioned as we we're chatting to her was that, look, if you're having diggers on site, just the best thing you can do is just drive it around. So I tried that and it was wonderful, the effect you could achieve. So we'd just drove it around did donuts for hours and hours and hours um, around a few of our fields. Again, just as test, not the whole, obviously not the whole 80 acres, but just what effects can I achieve? So now I now know that using a small digger, I can create wild boar effects. Now that digger then allows me to dig some test holes. So I've been digging and it's been rainy this week. Wherever it's been, I felt that it looked like it might be able to support a scrape, a pond or whatever. Thought, let's dig a bit, let's see what happens. And I've been rewarded by cascades of water from my first scoop uh, going into an area so now we have you know they are test holes but they are pretty impressive test holes in terms of i've scraped back the the the, the grass a bit it's filled up and it looks good and it's just given me so many kind of my increase my toolkit quite significantly so sorry that i've been kind of on my soapbox there chloe and looking at you're looking at me like, like come on tom stop talking now I'm like, <laughs> like this, guy. but diggers are awesome super valuable for rewilding and really good fun and not as complicated as you might think and I guess some people might be wondering, well, why didn't you just bring in a pig? That is obviously the natural process we're trying to mimic at this stage. But the challenge with pigs is, firstly, they actually can be incredibly destructive. And even having one or two pigs on 80 acres would be quite a challenge in terms of sort of maintaining the, you know, I guess other aspects of diversity, like some of our wildflowers and other things, if they were to completely go to town on it. And there are some practical challenges with, ha- with having pigs in terms of how you keep them safe and not dashing to our neighbour's field to do some uh, disturbance in their fields. Um, and equally, there is some evidence to say that they actually prefer, and perhaps understandably, um, digging up the areas where there has been the kind of the, the soil is perhaps not as improved and which is kind of the bits we want to keep because those are the bits where often the most diversity is, as opposed to the really kind of improved areas, which is where we want to really create the maximum disturbance. So those are all theories nobody really knows, but... There's also for us, we just wanted to get going with something and this felt like something practical we could get going with. Just to be clear, Chloe, we are going to have Percy Pig, right? This is going to happen. However, that is the point. Is, is With mechanical intervention, you can pick and choose where that intervention's happened. 
And at this stage, over the first one or two years where we're establishing it, doing specific inf- intervention, we need to be able to control where that goes in. Yeah, and this isn't obviously our medium term plan that every year Tom is going to be out on a digger pretending to be a wild boar. This is what we need to kind of kickstart some of those natural processes so that we're able to step back. I've already been Googling diggers, Chloe. So we do not need to add any more kits to our lives. Yes, we do. <laughs> Plenty of things. Anyway, so we said this recap was going to be two minutes and we're now on nearly 12. Uh, but yes, but it's been gold dust. So let's, <laughs> well, let's, see, let's disagree with that or not. <laughs> so that is it. In terms of interventions, that's as far as we've got. We do that. I think these interventions and rewilding efforts will, will come to the big announcement as well a little bit later on. Yes. Is it worth updating at this stage then our reflections in terms of the way we've chosen to move forward with the project? There's moved away slightly from maybe uh, you know, previous episodes, a few episodes back. Yeah, I think so. I think it's helpful to think about that, the journey we've been on and yeah, sort of the reflections that have led to that decision making process, I suppose. Regular listeners will, will remember that we had a really exciting announcement and I still stand by the excitement of the announcement. There's that uh, we will get a partner with Benedict McDonald's uh, with him and his team move forward as a consultancy essentially them kind of leading on and advising us on what to do after that announcement you know, a lot of the kind of water has gone under the bridge in terms of time and Chloe and I've had a lot of time to reflect and what we kind of felt was as we we're reflecting on it, is actually the excitement about this for us and what we hope for our listeners to enjoy is that journey that we are learning as we go along we're making the mistakes some things are going to work some things won't Benedict's almost just almost too good and i think i think is the, is the yeah. answer so i still stand by that you know, he is one of the leading lights in the space we just felt like despite that what we wanted to do is take more of a kind of a, an explorative approach it was the difference for us wasn't it about when people come walk around the land there's a different process from oh we did this intervention because we were told by one of the leading consultants in rewilding to do it mm-hmm. to actually we did some research we read this paper, we read this book on rewilding, we spoke to a lot of people that have done rewilding, we've tested this out and we kind of had a different relationship to the intervention because it's been more driven by our thinking as opposed to someone else's expertise. Yeah, well, it gets complicated because of course we still are going to speak to people who know what they're doing yeah. to make sure we're not doing something detrimental. Um, so it does get complicated here. But the long and the short of it is pulling off the plaster is basically we've chosen that Although Benedict is still going to come on the podcast, he's, he's a great guy and I'm really excited about it coming on as a guest and talking about it. We've chosen to kind of move away a little bit and go, let's see what we can achieve by using our brain power, speaking to our community and let's get things wrong. Let's get things right. Let's explore it as a journey. So hopefully you as a listener will agree with that. If you don't, again, feel free to send us a message. More happy to listen to feedback. And that is hello at grangeproject.co.uk. But hopefully the agree is a positive step forward. That segues nicely into... You know, we were thinking in preparation for this episode, what have been the things we've appreciated most about the last few months? And I think for me, it's been the opportunity to learn into a space that I knew very little about really prior to knowing that we wanted to do this nature restoration thing. And it felt really important to us, but actually learning about ecology, learning about natural processes. It's been a real privilege to engage myself in that journey and kind of connect with other people who were equally passionate about some of these ideas. I feel like that's been one of my main highlights over the last few months. Absolutely. And share that knowledge as well. I think my highlight has definitely been, you know, it has been this week because it has been a, I felt empowered by being able to do something and do something that I believe is the right thing to do and seeing the effect on the land. And I guess that's a product of your learning yeah. and the knowledge that we've discovered. And living in the forest of <laughs> for so long. <laughs> and I do a fair amount of lecturing and it's always sometimes the greatest opportunity to learn is by teaching others yes. because then you really have to distill down what it is you're, you've learned and to kind of regurgitate that back out in a way that's accessible and hopefully yeah. clear to people. Yeah, that, I think that's one of the joys of teaching and therefore for us it's a great thing to be able to try and share some of that with you and there's a lot more content to look out for over the next few months as we try and distill down into posts some of the things we're doing and why we're doing it with pictures videos etc exactly yeah another kind of one of the challenges i think we faced is everyone has their own opinion about what should or could be done with the land and how it should be done you speak to the monmouth shemedics group and they'd be really excited about meadows happening they if you speak to which again there's no right or wrong here i think it's is the point it's just that's what that's what they focus on that's what they're passionate about you speak to conservationists and there's a certain approach you speak to speaks to hardcore rewilders as an approach you speak to interventionative interventionative the people that like to do stuff do stuff proactively to the ground and they'll have a different approach and so you know it's very easy to, to find yourself drowning in opinions 
and kind of get that fear of, I don't know what to do now. And I'm, I'm going to upset some people by doing something and other people's by doing other things. So I think that's been a challenge. But what I hope from this journey, if other people are thinking about doing something similar is find what works for you, find your voice, find your passion. And you find it by speaking to people who have different views and you'll go away from the VT going that they're amazing, they're inspirational, you've learned so much from them. I'm not sure I felt comfortable with that approach, it doesn't fit with the way that I wanted to go forward with the project. But I'm going to put that as a bit of experience and next time I speak to someone, when it does ring true, you're like, ah, okay, now I understand why that does sound very good. It sounds like the right way forward. And it's just it's just building up, it's like dating basically. Yeah, okay. Um, and I'm sorry. <laughs> And I guess for me, one of the kind of key reflections over the last few months has been that I think rewilding itself, you know, restoring nature, enhancing biodiversity is perhaps not super complicated. There are particular principles that you need to follow, of course, and there's an intention behind what we're doing. But ultimately, it is experimental, it is about finding the fit for your project, whether that's a garden, a 80 acres or 1000 acres, it's about your particular unique setup and what feels like it's going to sing to you in terms of your value set and what you're trying to achieve with it. And this week I've come back to regularly looking at the field going, well, it can't be much more of a desert. So, you know, if I, whatever interventions we do, it's going to be beneficial unless we spray chemicals all over it or whatever, which of course is not going to be, <laughs> no. not going to be a thing. But I think that's a really interesting perspective because even you saying, looking at the field and thinking it's a desert, that is a learning point that mm -hmm. we've taken over the last few months, really. Really understanding what a healthy ecosystem looks like and how, sadly, how far from that a lot of fields are because of how fine policy has directed farming practice. And, you know, I guess nobody wants to go on country walks with me anymore because all I do is moan about the, the lack of na nature, I guess, and the lack of wilderness in the spaces that we walk around again i think it's worth us really balancing this and saying look you know we've bought we we have bought a farm that's because that's that's how you buy land in, in monmouthshire you don't just go and buy the land that they're attached to a farm this farm was used for farming so we're not poking holes in farming or farmers that have fields because fields are really useful for you know farming um so what we put our mission and what we're trying to do is change a small bit of monmouthshire and put it back to nature so it's not again it's not challenging the way farmers are it's just acknowledging that for what we're trying to achieve here, that is an ecological desert and we've got to change that and that's our mission. And I feel like this could open up a whole wide conversation about regenerative agriculture and the happy harmony that can be achieved between food production and nature, which I absolutely believe can be achieved. But I think we'll probably save that to another podcast. And another just, guest. And another guest. Yes. And just acknowledge that we are, although we are, there will absolutely still be elements of what we're doing that sits alongside food production. And perhaps we'll go on to talk a bit more about those later. But the fundamental reason for us being here is to privilege and protect nature in this, in this very relatively small part of a large agricultural area. So I want to talk about something, I'll get my mini soapbox again, because this is not something that people don't realise, but social media is good for lots of things, it's also quite toxic and bad for lots of other things. You get to see the perfect image of anyone ever does. That includes us. Our Instagram feed is full of really nice pictures of the land, us doing some really interesting, exciting things, and, and that's what our life looks like from a rewilding perspective. And I think it's just important to mention here that obviously it's not. Obviously, there's plenty of times when I'm still in my pyjamas, I haven't shaved, I'm smelly, you know, whatever it is because the kids have been ill and I'm, we're trying to still work and make some money here and also try and do the rewilding. It is really challenging to do this, but actually I, th I was expecting it to be hard, but I wasn't quite expecting it to, to be as challenging, as complicated, as um, uncertain, I think, uh, as, it, as it has kind of proven to be. Can I ask a therapy question? I've, I've, I've married you, haven't I? <laughs> I guess... What parts of this process have been surprisingly challenging for you? What do you think has been most draining or challenging from the process? Um, me personally? Go for it. I think it's been dealing with the people in this industry. And I, and again, I must have had a very naive view of this world that I thought if everyone does things, everyone in this industry is doing, trying to do things for the good, surely everyone would try and push in the same direction. And that was completely naive of me and I so I assume that doing this you just speak to a lot of really motivated people you get some great advice everyone will be able to like point you in the right direction and we just be up and running and it'd be great and it just hasn't proven to be like that everyone is same intentions but pulling in different directions so for us as newbies to the sector and to rewilding it has been a, a trial by fire to know who to listen to what to listen to where to get advice from where not to get advice from the pitfalls to avoid how where to start doing your interventions and 
yeah so that, that i think for me that's been the, the biggest drain because again i feel these things as you as you know i'm saying i'm a sensitive soul i think i feel these things more personally than uh, some people i hear that and i would identify with that experience stop psychologizing me so i can't psychologize you i guess i just i you know it for me it's been the kind of exhaustion of decisions and not know whether we're making the right decision the wrong decision and you know, I guess it's always the question of capacity. Like we are, as as you mentioned, you know, we're trying to work. We've got a family. Like the resilience is required when we sit down to record a podcast at half past nine, and then the recording doesn't work. I mean, fuck that. Yeah, and then we do it again with the same energy. I was popular for that episode. Yeah, I'm surprised this happens today. <laughs> you know, that kind of energy is hard, but I think it's that energy of the questioning all the time are we doing the right thing that is almost harder and I think perhaps we've come to a place of we feel like we've got enough foundational knowledge now to know that actually sometimes experimentation is the right thing yeah but no it is it's, you're right actually it's a good point about resilience there because we wrote this list on the whiteboard just yesterday but things it's funny how things change in a 24-hour period in terms of yesterday we were tired we were fatigued you know two of the three kids have had temperatures and away off from school etc whereas today Kids are feeling better. We've had an amazing day on the land. And we haven't even talked about natural resources. Whales being here. I think we can't go into that. Okay. We're going to blow people's minds. We're going to save that. Save that for later. Next episode. Yeah. We, yeah, we didn't. But we had lots of people here. We had some amazing solar panels, obviously, and pre-app conversations. So, you know, and I feel even more positive. So I'm like, wow, this doesn't feel that hard now. <laughs> but I've got such a short memory, which is one of the things oh, you love about me. Yeah, it's, just, it's quite helpful. helpful. <laughs> So my final reflection before we move on to things to look forward to and our big announcement is that probably said on previous episodes, but I believe that climate change, biodiversity, rewilding space, whatever, are not doing good enough with the story narrative. We're very good at saying, here's the stats, here's the figures, isn't it bad? But I'm really passionate about making sure we turn this into a story narrative that other people can engage with. And I just want to reflect on an example of that, which is the Sycamore Gap tree that got cut down. I've ran Hadrian's Wall. I've stopped at that tree. I've got photos of it. I've got. I'm very connected to that tree specifically. I say very. I'm. I was. I was very happy to be there when I was there. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure I have that massive connection. But so when it was cut down, I was sad. I thought about doing a social media post and realised I'm not that type of person. However, what I saw from the I don't know what I call it, but the environmental side of social media of, of this. Well, why are we worrying about this one tree when we've got? polluted rivers and, and woods being cut down and I just find that really an interesting thing to be seeing because what people like that could be doing and should be doing I hope is thinking wow how has this one tree got so much attention maybe we should be looking into that storytelling and go and use that for what we care about those, those the forests the, the rivers how do we turn it into a story that people who are not already engaged about it and wringing their arms their hands about it can engage with and care about it and I, I think that's Hopefully, one of the things we are looking into with the podcast, with our recording studio, we're hopefully going to build and kind of future partnerships going forward is storytelling on a personal level about things to make it relevant to them. Yeah, I'm a big believer in the power of stories. And I think that is what people leave with and what people connect emotionally. And I think when you connect with people emotionally, then that's when you help people to sometimes make uncomfortable choices as opposed to the statistics, which can be very powerful for some people who are already kind of engaged and concerned and actually can be quite anxiety provoking for a lot of that group it's actually i think for the people that are perhaps not already in that place of engagement the human stories in particular are what had impact it's kind of final point kind of all blends into one we've got things we're looking forward to and the big announcement it's pretty much the same thing because i'm super excited by it uh before we go into that big announcement is worth mentioning that as well as getting an opportunity to spend the first winter here and Christmas here and getting to see how the land changes. Uh, we are extremely excited by this pre-application we just had. We had the local Monmouthshire Council representative come out and had a super positive, open-minded conversations about what we're trying to do and given us, I think, a very clear way forward and a significant amount of confidence with what we are hoping to achieve on the land. I so appreciated the opportunity for this pre-application conversation because it really felt like we were working from a collaborative place right from the start. And I think what's really exciting is it really feels what we're trying to do aligns with a lot of both national and local planning policy, which is obviously reassuring to us as we step forward with our plans for the education centre and for our eco cabins. Yeah, we didn't get shot down, which was, again, was, was our fear going into yeah, the today. Definitely. Okay. The big announcement. Now, obviously, we said that now about five times during this thing. Um, we hope the listeners will, will find this really interesting. So we've been 
thinking about amongst ourselves about how we engage more people in what we're doing and make this more of a collaborative effort. Absolutely. So our big brainy idea that may completely fall flat on its face, but again, happy to fail, is that we're going to work with Sarah King over at Rewilding Britain. She's the rewilding manager. Do you want to explain the big ideal slide? I think you'll do a better job. I'll correct you when it goes wrong. Okay. So we're aware there are, it's a privilege to own land. And we're also aware that there are plenty of passionate, exp- experienced, and qualified people going on rewilding courses, places like the amazing Embercombe that run rewilding courses, and other, you know, ecologists and other places who are looking at nature restoration, nature restoration as a, as a, as a profession maybe won't have that opportunity to rewild their own place. So what we're thinking of doing, and I'm really excited by it, is running a, I don't want to say competition, but the applications for people who want to, maybe a team or an individual who might want to take a chunk of the land here between what 10 and 15 acres and make it their own and come up with their own plan of how they would manage this bit. So we'll split the eight acres down into, you know, five to six projects. And then once people will submit those ideas, those plans, we then work with the amazing Sarah King to connect these mosaics of ideas together in a kind of a cohesive, interconnected way, and then invite those people down to enact it and manage it over three to five years. So a real opportunity for people to show what they've learned, put it into action, and then hopefully be able to not only make a big impact on the Grange project, but also improve their CVs and their experience so they can take that further forward the next step in their careers. And I think for me, what's really exciting about that is the opportunity for kind of experimentation and to be innovative. When you work with people that are new to a space or they're learning, often they can come with bravery and new thinking. And we're really wanting to kind of welcome that here and also welcome perhaps using some diverse approaches you know we know we want more scrubland like scrubland is good for lots of it's a great habitat which we don't have enough of in the uk so how do we go about achieving scrubland kickstarting that as quickly as possible whilst also then sustaining it as a you know using natural processes and i think well there i know there are numerous different methods that we could use so why not invite different people to test out different ideas in different places on the land and obviously there's no it's not like an experimental comparison because there are so many confounding variables that it's not really a relevant you can't it's like comparing apples with pears but it is it's an opportunity and it's a conversation isn't it about what we find has different effects on the land yeah an, an example of that is i now know that i can do wild boring with a digger right so so probably if i was left to my own devices what i would do is go and do the same effect across 40 percent or whatever of the grange project here and that would either be super successful or not successful at all and we all know that what we get told is we've got to keep create textures and mosaics and that's what everyone says in rewilding and that it, i would just use what i know across the whole land and i think that's a bad idea right we would we would do that so what you know sarah was very excited by is that we get six to seven to eight groups of people's ideas in all connecting the plans but doing things in a different way even if it's just driving a digger in a different way and different methods it will create different outcomes and that's what's really excited by this It's almost like we're working towards the ultimate mosaic of both habitats and ideas that hopefully will form some sort of coherent whole and also always be underpinned by the kind of key principles of rewilding. So not losing sight of those. Yeah. So that is the announcement. Watch this space. Sarah's going to come early in November to come visit the land. And I think we'll chat with her in more detail about how we flesh this out and how we run the applications. Of course, you know, if this is the kind of thing that's interesting to you or someone you might know, please do send on our details and ask them to send us an email at hello at grangeprojects.co.uk because it would be useful to know if this is of interest to our listeners. And I guess obviously we hopefully will have a role in sort of sourcing some help. Uh, we've already had some volunteers reach out that are keen to get involved with projects and equally in terms of you know accessing grants and, and trying to find sources of funding for these different projects. Yeah, we're absolutely here to sort of support with the facilitation of that. And get stuck in. Yeah. I'm so looking forward to meeting all the people, sharing ideas and helping out as well. It's a collaborative rewilding project. Yeah. It's a trade market. <laughs> right. That is it. I think, you know, I hope this edits down to something around 40 minutes. It's been a little bit longer than that for our listeners. 
But I hope it's been interesting. We hope that you've, you know, you're really up to speed with the project and and it's been valuable. Again, please let us know other the, whether this episode was interesting to you. Feedback is what will help guide us going forward. That's one of those things where I have no idea whether it's made any sense, has any form of coherence, whether it's just been us rambling on for 40 minutes. But yeah, I think it's it's us wanting to share our workings out and be truly transparent about the process. And they'll be back to normal for that next week with our fantastic guests. Ryan, Chloe, are you uh, happy? I'm happy. Right, I'll see you next episode. Thanks, everyone. Nice drink. Bye.